Hello friends and welcome to another online video of Ms. Hoskins AP Environmental Science. This section is on population and community ecology. So in populations and communities, the abundance of distribution and populations. By the end of this video, you should be able to explain how nature exists at several levels of complexity and discuss those characteristics of populations. In contrast, these effects of density dependent and density independent factors on population growth can also be accounted for. Nature exists at several levels of complexity. The environment around us exists as a series of increasing complex levels, individuals, populations, communities, ecosystems, and then eventually the biosphere. The simplest level is the individual, a single organism. As we've seen before, natural selection operates at a level of the individual because the individual is the one that must survive to reproduce. The second level of complexity is what we call a population. And a population is composed of all the individuals that, that belong to the exact same species and live in a given area in a, at a particular time. Evolution occurs at the level of a population. So scientists who study populations are also interested in the factors that cause the number of individuals to increase or decrease. The boundaries of a population are rarely clear and may be set arbitrarily by scientists to create examples. But depending upon what we want to learn, we might study the entire population of white-tailed deer in North America, for example. Or we might focus on a single deer that lives within a single community in Red Top Mountain National Forest. The third level of complexity is what we would call a community. And a community incorporates all of the populations of organisms within a given area like those of a population where the boundaries may be defined by several states or by a federal agency. Um, usually at this point, humans are responsible for managing these areas. And scientists who study communities are generally interested in how species interact with one another. Communities exist within an ecosystem, which consists of all the biotic and abiotic components in a particular location. Ecosystem ecologists, they study flows of energy and matter, um, which is like a cycling of nutrients throughout the system. In the largest and most complex system environmental, science, environmental scientists they study is the biosphere, and that incorporates a lot of Earth's ecosystems. When we have studied the, the nature and the level of a science population, one of the things that becomes apparent to population dynamics is that they are constantly changing. Individuals in a population, you know, they die. You know, in, in, new individuals are reproduced. Those individuals can move from one population to another. The study of all these factors that encase populations um, to increase or decrease in the science is what we call population ecology. There are many circumstances in which scientists find it useful to identify factors that influence population size over time. In the case of an endangered species in California, the condor, which we've seen before, knowing the factors that affect its population size has helped us to implement measures that improve its survival and reproduction. Another good example would be knowing the factors that influence population size of pests can help us control pests. So for instance, if a population ecologist is currently studying the emerald ash, an insect found in Asia, and it was accidentally introduced into the American Midwest, it caused this widespread death of all these ash trees. Once we understand the population of this very destructive insect, we can begin to explore and develop strategies on how to control it and how to, how to eradicate it. Unfortunately, our history is full of lots of successes and lots of very, very detrimental, non-successful implementations of things. You can drive through any part of Atlanta and see kudzu still on a rise after decades and decades of trying to eradicate it. But it's the responsibility of an environmental scientist to study the nature of several different levels of complexity, even if it ranged from an individual organism all the way to the biosphere, 
because at each level we can focus on some sort of different process that can help us either improve or discover what's going on in the world around us, how we've changed it, and how we can improve it. Populations have very distinctive characteristics. When we study the nature of the levels of a population, one of the first things that comes apparent is that populations are dynamic. They're basically constantly changing. There are five basic characteristics of these ever-changing populations. Population size is the total number of individuals within a defined area. So for example, that California condor that we were once talking about used to range throughout California and the southeastern United States. And then over the past two centuries, the combination of poaching, poisoning, um, accidents, you name it, have greatly reduced this population size of condors down to what we can now hold as 22 birds remaining in the wild, period. And scientists realized that the species was nearing extinction and decided to capture all the wild birds and start a captive breeding program in zoos. This happened in, I want to say, the late 80s, like 1987 is when it started. As a result of capturing all these birds and conserving them, the now new condor population of 20, 2015 and the last recorded one is at about 437 birds. So population size is the total number of individuals, whether we can count it or estimate it or not. Population density is the number of individuals per unit. And usually we say per unit volume, if it's an aquatic organism or its density per area. But knowing the population's density in addition to its actual size can help us estimate whether a species is rare or abundant. I mean, like, how do we know? For example, like the density of coyotes in some parts of Texas might only be one coyote per square kilometer. But in other parts of the state, it might be as high as 12 per square kilometer. Scientists also study the population density to determine if the population in particular, in a particular location, um, might be dense or less dense uh, due to a food supply issue. So population density can be particularly useful to measure wildlife um, management in certain areas um, who need to set like hunting records or fishing limits. Um, you know, when they want you to only be able to hunt so many deer per year or collect fish that are only of such a certain uh, sexual maturity size. And wildlife managers, um, they divide this entire population of animal species into parts that can be hunted and parts that need to be protected. This is also crucial to where, um, where the government is trying to manage zones, like specific areas that are zoned for um, political usage or natural wildlife boundaries, um, even a body of water is important. Wildlife management Officials might offer more um, hunting or fishing permits or zone an area for that is a high density population for a road to be built um, or fewer permits might be zoned if we know the population is less dense in that area. So in addition to population size and density, you know, ecologists are also interested in how um, a population occupies its physical space. We call that population distribution. And this is a description of how individuals are distributed with respect to one another. So in the next slide, you're going to see three different types of, um, how, of ways that populations can be distributed. A population sex ratio is the ratio of males to females, essentially. And in most sexually reproducing species, the sexual ratio is 50-50. Although sex ratios are far from equal in most species, in wasp, for example, that's one really cool example, there are as many as 20 females for every male. It is definitely um, hunting season there. And for humans, although you might think that we are 50-50, the truth is, is that it's more of a 51% to 49%, 51% female to 49% male. So this is three different ways that a population can be distributed. You know, populations, they distribute themselves um, in a couple of different ways for, for several different reasons. 
Many tree species um, like to be distributed randomly. I mean, there's no apparent pattern to individuals. Um, sometimes birds like to be distributed in a very, very uniform way. Equal distance amongst each other can increase, um, you know, like, it's like spacing out your houses uh, in your living space. If everyone had equal space between them, it just provides harmony in the community. Some organisms like a, and prefer a more clumped distribution. Um, you know, like one of the best examples that I know of a, of a clumped distribution is meerkats. You can go to any zoo and see how they live in these um, mounds, these family mounds. And they, so they are clumped and distributed amongst, amongst their geographic area. Um, another factor might be a population's age structure. Age structure. A population's age structure describes how many individuals kind of like fit into a particular area or category. And knowing their age structure can help a scientist determine how rapidly the population can grow back. Uh, so, for instance, a population um, that has a very large portion of old individuals who are like no longer capable of reproducing, like uh, gorillas <laughs> is an example that comes to mind. Um, in a population that has individuals that are really too young to reproduce, those guys are going to find it very difficult to rebound when there's not a lot of sexually reproductive um, members of that population. All of this can affect how species are distributed.